The reason why I advocate democracy in general is, is for two reasons. One, I think the survey data, as we discussed, shows us that actually people want democracy. And uh, I think we need to be responsive to what most people want. And secondly, that the empirical research I've done shows me that democracy is actually going to be a better model for economic development. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. How is democracy viewed on the African continent? Has democracy delivered development? Can the Rwandan model of development be replicated elsewhere? And what should be done to stop elections from being rigged? These are some of the questions I discussed with my guest, Nick Cheeseman, who is a professor of democracy at the University of Birmingham. Nick has worked extensively on democracy, elections and development, including a range of topics such as election rigging, political campaigning, corruption, fake news and executive legislative relations. Nick and I discussed several of his books, including Democracy in Africa, how to rig an election, and his most recent book with Gabriel Lynch and Justin Willis, The Moral Economy of Elections in Africa. My team and I hope you're enjoying season three of the show. Thank you for the encouraging feedback that we receive from you every week. We are now taking a short Christmas break, but we'll be back in the new year with another bunch of excellent guests. Happy holidays. It's been great to be in touch with you over the years, Nick, and I'm thrilled that we finally have a chance to actually chat on this show. Welcome. Thank you. I can't wait. I've been looking forward to this all week. And even Nairobi traffic couldn't stop us today. So, um, Nick, you are in many ways Mr. Democracy. You've been studying democracy for many years. Let's start by discussing the fact that while you and I, of course, love democracy, we may find democracy to be of intrinsic value, but also instrumental value. Not everybody is convinced, right, that democracy is a good thing and that democracy is not necessarily universally loved. It is actually a contested concept. So let's let's begin by discussing, Nick, how do you think democracy is viewed on the African continent? What are the current debates around democracy as you see them? Thanks. That is a great question. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, from, you know, when I published Democracy in Africa in 2015 to today, if I go and give a talk, I'll get a lot of people who think that democracy is probably the best political system for Africa. But I will get at least two or three questions in every talk that are basically about isn't authoritarianism better for development in Africa? Doesn't democracy breed corruption and conflict? Wouldn't a different model, i.e. perhaps the one that Paul Kagame is running in Rwanda, be a better way for Africa to develop? Is democracy possible in this particular context? So it's definitely a really big debate. Um, and I think a couple of things have really promoted that debate and the idea that authoritarianism might be a better model in the last few years. I think one is the rise of China which of course gives a kind of example of a non-democratic alternative that is economically successful. I think one is the kind of democratic failures of Western states. You know, the example of the US with Donald Trump and the capital uh, attack, uh, the UK and Brexit, the kind of apparent kind of inability of established democracies to manage their own business. And then, as I say, I think the third on the African continent is the effective work um, that Paul Kagame has done, both in terms of, you know, operationalizing a developmental model in an authoritarian state, but also then very explicitly advertising that as an alternative to Western democracy. So I think those three things taken together have really made this a big debate. But... When you actually look at the data, you know, if you were to actually go and look at the Afrobarometer survey data, and I'd encourage people who are listening to go to afrobarometer.org, you can get all of the data and download it, play around with it, look at all the surveys they've done over many years, many countries now. Uh, what you'll see 
is that actually the vast majority of African citizens in pretty much every country in Africa want democracy. And if you ask what democracy means, for many people, that means, you know, a fairly classic kind of understanding. It means elections. It means government of the people, for the people, by the people. And it's also interesting that a lot of people would say, ah, well, Africans might want a form of democracy that actually is different to that in the West. But again, if you ask people consistently, we see in surveys very high levels of support for, for example, presidential term limits, very high levels of support for things like freedom of speech. So I always say that, you know, despite the fact that this is a debate and it's a good debate to have, I think it's good to force people who think democracy is a good thing to actually defend that and evidence that and explain why. I also think that if we actually move away from some very powerful voices, what we start to see is actually the vast majority of people, with some variations that we could talk about if you're interested, but the vast majority of people in countries on the African continent actually want to live under a democracy. I'm glad you mentioned the Afrobarometer surveys. And uh, for many years, of course, they've been showing that there is indeed, as you say, strong support for democracy. But there is this feeling that democracy has you know, somehow failed many of these citizens. So there's this dissatisfaction with what democracy has given a lot of these countries. How do you see that kind of you know, result from these surveys? And And I'm particularly interested in hearing your views on Rwanda since you mentioned that because you know I was speaking with Paul Collier a couple of uh, weeks ago and of course he was full of praise for you know what Rwanda has achieved and he was referring to the fact that what Rwanda has done apart from of course the the charismatic and some would say visionary leadership of Paul Kagame is that there is elements of a common interest state as Tim Besley puts it and these are some of the sort of combination of things that have helped Rwanda develop leadership and some sort of uh, common interest state that has been built in contrast to many other countries on the continent that have had democratic elections, but have failed to deliver development for their people. Thanks, Dan. So I think if we start at the beginning of what you were saying there and we look at, you know, the frustration that many people feel towards the way that democracy is played out, I think a really big question that we haven't yet answered is, are people angry at democracy itself or do people feel that democracy has not been properly implemented in their country? In other words, are we seeing people who are giving up on the concept and principle of democracy and looking for an authoritarian alternative? Or when they say they're dissatisfied with democracy in their country, do they really mean, I want to live in a democracy and this government isn't allowing me to live in a democracy? And I think we need to know a bit more about that. But it's very clear that there has been a decline in satisfaction with democracy in many different African countries. And I think it's easy to see why. You know, on the one hand, we see modest levels of economic growth, but in a lot of countries that has not translated into better jobs or better standards of living for those at the bottom of the scale. And at the same time, we see repeated elections that are often controversial and in some cases flawed. And some of the recent research that's been done by Mike Bratton um, and Bob Matters and others have and the Afrobarometer data suggests that perhaps one of the things you know, that is driving dissatisfaction with the way that democracy is, is playing out is this combination you know, of economic difficulties and flawed elections or controversial elections. And so I suppose my real concern in terms of how we move forwards is that the real danger for democracy is if we see a combination of economic downturn, which we now are because of COVID-19, and this consistent pattern of problematic elections gradually eroding people's confidence that their political system can deliver change. You know, I remember looking at some survey data that basically showed that in Uganda, a majority of Ugandans do not believe you can change power through the ballot box. And as soon as you get to that, you know, level of kind of frustration and anger and recognition of the challenges within the system, then of course support for democracy is really vulnerable. But I think it's also important to say that you know almost everywhere I've gone and done research and done field work and talked to people I have found democracy activists risking their life to promote free speech to try and save independent media to try and protect human rights and I found citizens on the ground 
who, even if they might favor certain kinds of restrictions on their activities, fundamentally want to be able to have a say in the decisions that affect their own lives. And to me, that desire to have a decision to, you know, over the, to have a say over the decisions that affect your own life is something that, you know, to me, I found it in almost every society I've been in, but it's particularly pronounced in a number of the countries I've worked in in Africa where people have lived under long periods of authoritarian rule, whether one party states or one person dictatorships or military rule, and perfectly understand the problems of those systems and understand what it was like to not be able to say what you think, and also understand that many of those systems failed economically even more than the current democracies are failing. And I think one thing we must not do is forget the lessons of history. It is true that Rwanda is an impressive example right now. But we know from the 1970s and 1980s that in most countries, one party states, military rule, one person dictatorships were poor. They performed poorly on national integration, poorly on building national identity, and they performed poorly when it came to economic growth. There were many countries in Africa that were not that much richer in the 1990s than they were in the 1960s. Now, some of that is to do with global inequality. Some of that is to do with colonial legacies. But it was also because those governments systematically failed to perform well on the economy. So the idea that welcoming those systems back across the continent will necessarily you know, generate better economic reform I think is really problematic. And that brings me to your very good question about Rwanda. I think there's two things that, you know, it's really important to say about Rwanda. The first is, to me, the Rwandan model works for very specific historical reasons that are um, rooted in Rwanda's own particular political history. You know, it's based on Paul Kagame establishing tight centralized control over both the political system and over economic rents and using that to basically establish a kind of long time horizon, driving government based led you know, investments, and then basically an economic model where the party has taken over key areas of the economy and party and state-owned enterprise have taken over key areas of the economy and used that, you know, to drive investment in the economy, but also use that to sustain a political monopoly. And that combination of factors has enabled a kind of party or government-dominated economy to boost economic growth while not becoming mired in corruption. I don't think that model can be implemented in most other countries in Africa. I don't think you could implement that model in Nigeria. You know, who would you select as the dominant president who runs for 25 years in Nigeria? Who would you select in a country like Kenya? I think that, you know, attempt to create that level of centralization that's necessary for that system to work would be unviable. I think it would lead to mass popular anger amongst those communities and those groups that were not seen to be represented by the person you chose. And I think that would foster political instability that in turn would undermine any economic gains that you might make. So I don't disagree that the Rwanda model in itself is impressive in terms of its economic performance, but I'm not sure it can actually be applied anywhere else. And the second point I would then make just very quickly is I think we also have to ask about how sustainable some of the authoritarian models are. You know, if we'd have been having this conversation five, ten years ago, the two examples of a successful authoritarian system people might have given us would have been Ethiopia and Rwanda. People won't give Ethiopia today because the system's fallen apart, because its internal contradictions essentially undermined the growth model that the EPRDF was trying to put together. And I'm not suggesting that that's going to happen to Rwanda tomorrow or in the next five years at all. But I'm just saying that one of the things I think we really have to ask is, are those authoritarian models of development that are often lauded really sustainable? You know, was the model around Museveni and Uganda sustainable? Probably not. Ethiopia? Probably not. Rwanda is still there, but I'm not sure that actually that's a sustainable model of development for the next 20 years. So I think for me, I don't see that model being applied elsewhere effectively, and I'm not sure how sustainable it is even within you know, the countries in which it's applied. And that's why I'm very reluctant you know, to go along with the idea that authoritarianism might somehow deliver better developmental outcomes.
I totally see your point about how Rwanda has been somewhat unique. The history, the genocide, the rise of the party, the leader, all of this has come together rather nicely. And somehow this model appears to be far more attractive than, as you were saying, 10 years ago, if one were looking at Ethiopia. By the way, for a while, of course, Ethiopia was looking very good in terms of being one of the fastest growing African economies and actually one of the fastest growing in the world. But of course, Rwanda has done certain things that are much better. It is difficult to see another Paul Kagame somewhere else. In fact, a criticism has been that what happens when when he leaves, if he does leave, you know, who would Rwanda find to, to sort of replace him? But I want to return to this um, other example that you mentioned, the popularity or the rise of China and how important China has been in Africa in terms of infrastructure projects, in terms of just the sheer visibility of China. And a lot of African citizens, of course, are traveling to China. They've seen this uh, very visible development that has taken place. And, you know, I've been teaching in Malawi for so many years. When I talk to civil servants there, as well as in many other countries, there is often this this praise for Kagame and you know this this longing to replicate that but there's also this praise for for China and the kind of debates that that they often are involved with me my students is to say you know why should democracy or civil and political freedoms come first look at China there they have actually achieved a certain level of economic development why can't we also have that in our parts of the world. So so what do you think about that, the impact of that Chinese model? Do you think that has been counterproductive for democracy on the African continent? I think, I mean, I think it represents a major challenge. And I think one of the things that those of us who, who believe in democracy need to do is to explain why perhaps in the African context, we think that the democracy might work better than that Chinese model. Now, you know, the first thing, of course, I should say now, and to some extent, I should have said it at the very beginning of the interview is, you know, it's not for me to tell uh, people living in African countries, you know, what system they should have. It's not my decision. And certainly as a as a white middle class northern guy, it's really not my place. Um, the reason why I advocate democracy in general is, is for two reasons. One, I think the survey data, as we discussed, shows us that actually people want democracy. And uh, I think we need to be responsive to what most people want. And secondly, that the empirical research I've done shows me that democracy is actually going to be a better model for economic development. So maybe I'll just say a couple of things about that. It is tempting to think that the Chinese model would work, right? And we have a lot of kind of a, a long history of this idea within the literature, the idea that we kind of need developmental states and developmental states might be kind of more authoritarian, they might get things done, they might be more efficient, they overcome collective action problems, and they basically allow for rapid development and infrastructural development. And then once we've got that, we can then democratize. Because the danger of democracy is that everybody demands everything early on, everyone wants to be satisfied after every election. And so your government gets distracted in terms of providing short term consumption and satisfying people's immediate needs, rather than making the short-term sacrifices needed for your long-term economic growth. You know, that kind of idea has been there within the economic literature and to some extent, you know, the politics literature, you know, for the last couple of hundred years. But I think if you actually look at sub-Saharan Africa, there are reasons to believe that that model actually doesn't work the way people want it to. You know, the kind of way it maybe worked in South Korea, maybe worked in Taiwan, maybe works in China right now. Because again, going back to the 1970s and 1980s, we saw examples of that kind of model. We saw one party states, we saw leaders who had vast powers and relatively limited checks and balances. And what we saw in that period was that actually the tendency towards authoritarianism didn't create more efficient systems that allowed for you know, the construction of effective states and allowed for the development of the economy. It actually created a system where the political monopoly actually encouraged corruption and encouraged abuse. And we actually had higher levels of corruption and abuse 
in most of those authoritarian systems than we do in the counterpart democracies of today. So what I think would probably happen if all of a sudden someone waved a wand and you swapped all the democracies in Africa for more authoritarian states with less checks and balances, is not that we'd get efficient governments that would deliver development in the next 10 years, but that actually the problems people have identified in those systems would become exacerbated by the fact that those politicians wouldn't have any accountability, wouldn't have any threat of losing a future election, and that we'd actually start to see a return to the kind of stagnation of the 1980s. Now, saying that is basically to say that we might want to think very carefully about what kinds of economic models and what kinds of political models work best in different contexts. It might be that an authoritarian model of development works okay in parts of Asia, but actually turns out not to work so well in Africa. It might be that democracy doesn't work as well in parts of Asia and actually somehow works better in Africa. And I think we need to maybe move away from the idea that every model will work in every context to think about what are the specific features of the political and economic context we're trying to address, what kind of models might work there. So just to give you an example of you know, what comes out if we take that sort of approach, if you actually look at authoritarian regimes in Africa and their state capacity and their ability to deliver services over the last sort of 10, 15 years, and you look at the same group of states in other regions, what you'll see is that in a lot of other parts of the world, there's been a kind of authoritarian resurgence. My colleague, Robert Forer, has done some really nice work on this. And basically, you see that there has been a sort of bit of an improvement in authoritarian regimes around the world. But if you look at the sort of line for Africa, the authoritarian regimes in Africa have actually stagnated. They haven't had that improvement that authoritarian regimes elsewhere have seen. So if you take, you know, there's a couple of examples where, of course, people would say, yes, they have. Look at Rwanda. OK, but if you take Rwanda and park it just for one second as one example, if you look at the other sort of 1920 pretty authoritarian regimes in sub-Saharan Africa, almost none of them have emulated the Rwandan example. In most of those cases, we have not seen a significant improvement in you know, the quality of life or national identity or infrastructure or any of the kind of dimensions of state capacity that you might want to point to. So I think my point here is, you know, and it goes back to the sort of previous discussion as well, I think Rwanda is a really interesting case, but I also think it's a real outlier. And I don't think the rest of Africa should follow one outlier when actually, if we were to look at it, the percentage of authoritarian regimes in Africa that perform well is vanishingly small. It is pretty depressing if you look at the number of democracies that that are thriving, because recent reports, and there are numerous reports that have been published, show very clearly that we're really facing a democratic recession. And just before we started recording this conversation on Twitter, there was quite a lot of attention on the Democracy Index from 2020 that The Economist magazine, the Economic Intelligence Unit, published um, earlier this year. And of course, that was showing that government imposed lockdowns and all kinds of other pandemic control measures has resulted in this huge rollback of civil liberties last year. And so many countries, you know, have seen their democracies being downgraded. And I was, you know, I visited the website and I found that there are very few countries in sub-Saharan Africa that are, at least according to this democracy index, classified as being full democracies. And so we're talking about Mauritius, Cape Verde, Botswana, and South Africa. And then there are, of course, all these other categories, flawed democracies, as in Ghana and Namibia and Lesotho, and then hybrid regimes in Malawi and Madagascar, Senegal. So you have this whole range. And then, of course, at the other end, with authoritarian regimes, you have Congo and, and Central African Republic and Chad and Equatorial Guinea and Eritrea, Burundi. If you were to look around, and I know you are now talking to me from, from Nairobi, what is your impression? If you were to say, you know, has democracy been working? What would you highlight as the real success stories in Africa at the moment? I think, I mean, I've, you know, I agree with you about the general trend and I've written about that in, in a couple of places 
you know, I think we have seen the pandemic abused by leaders to consolidate their power. We have seen greater censorship. We have seen, uh, for example, think about the Ugandan elections, the pandemic and the threat of COVID-19 used to prevent opposition parties from campaigning properly and so on. So I recognize all of that, but perhaps because of my personal experiences over the last year, I, I am a bit more positive. You know, I was lucky enough to be in Malawi for the 2020 elections and indeed for the nullification of the nine, 2019 elections when first the Constitutional Court and then the Supreme Court nullified that election. We had a rerun. That rerun was then you know, won by the opposition in a, forming a new coalition. And then I was also very lucky to be in Zambia when, when H.A. Takenda Hichilima, the opposition leader, won a famous and incredible victory in a way with a massive margin of victory over a president who was clearly attempting to manipulate the elections. And so I guess for me, having been in Malawi and been in Zambia, which are perhaps the two countries that during the pandemic have moved towards democracy rather away from democracy. I, mean, I remember the Freedom House report that said 83 countries have moved away from democracy during the pandemic and one has moved towards it and that one was Malawi. Having been in Malawi and Zambia over the last year and seen the democracy win and seen you know, pro-democracy forces defeat um, you know, governments that were entrenched. I, you know, that both of those events gave me a big, a big sort of shot in the arm for my sort of belief in in the ability of democracy to work and the ability of citizens and parties working together to force out poorly performing and authoritarian regimes. Of course, it's not the case that you can replicate that everywhere. And one of the things I've been doing over the past few months is having conversations with colleagues and democracy activists in Kenya and Zimbabwe who are desperate to know, you know, what's the lesson of Zambia? How can we do that here? And of course, one of the sad things that we have to say is that you can't just replicate that here because actually in Zimbabwe, for example, you have a military and a security forces that are a veto to change that simply don't exist in the same way in Malawi and Zambia. But I do think that if we look at those cases, it demonstrates to us that actually African states not only, you know, can build democratic systems, but actually over the past year have been leading the world in terms of actually having some positive stories in the context of a very poor pandemic and democratic backsliding. Yeah, I love the fact that Malawi was the country of the year in some of these reports. And, uh, you know, I, I've been going to Malawi for 16 years. It's just the last two years I haven't been able to travel and I really miss it. But I've been in constant contact, of course, with my students and with my colleagues and even though there is this, or there was at least last year and also earlier this year, this optimism with what the Constitutional Court was able to do and reverse the outcome of the election, and you had this new coalition come to power, there is, Nick, and, and you've been there, of course, of late, there is this creeping disenchantment also with the new regime. So, you know, we are in a way back to this earlier discussion about great, this initial euphoria with elections leads to this disappointment along the road where a new regime is seen to be doing more of the same as the previous regime. I wanted to uh, turn our attention to the role of elections. And I know you've been writing about this. And in one of your recent books, The Moral Economy of Elections in Africa, that you've published with Gabriel Lynch and Justin Willis, you, of course, argue that elections are the site of intense moral contestation, which in a way explains why there's so much attention on actually participating in an election process that may actually, for many, appear to be flawed. So there's this intense interest to vote, even though people are somewhat skeptical. So elections then are viewed as being this very important catalyst, as I understand, for democracy and development. And there's this hope in many parts of Africa, as in other parts of the world, that the secret ballot is going to really somehow transform the state and the state is suddenly then able to deliver development for its citizens. Is that really the case what did you find, Nick? And do elections really turn people into democratic citizens? Thanks. I mean, I think this is, you know, to me, this is perhaps the book that I that I published that I kind of most want people to read um, because it tries to basically turn a lot of what we we think about elections on its head. It, it says, look. You know, elections in Africa are not just about ethnicity. It's not just about vote buying. It's not just about an ethnic census. 
And it's not an ideology free space in which, you know, nothing matters. There's no policy, there's no debate, there's no issues. Actually, these, as you say, are sites of important moral contestation. A great example of that right now is Kenya, where Deputy President William Ruto is preparing his presidential campaign. And he's running on the narrative that he is a hustler who has fought his way up from nothing. And he's on the side of other Kenyans who are hustlers. And he's explicitly critiquing the people in power who he's characterizing as the dynasties and the people who've been in power since independence and saying that they're exploiting the ordinary citizens. But his candidacy, his presidency would return power, you know, and developments to, to the ordinary people, the Wananti, the citizens. So, you know, in lots of cases I've been in, you know, it's very clear to me that as well as ethnicity and clientelism, of course, all those things are there. There's these really interesting, high-pitched moral battles and arguments about what does it mean to be a good leader? What should leaders do? Is it appropriate for leaders to deliver to their communities? Is it more appropriate for leaders to deliver public goods for the nation? And we often see, especially at the local level, if you look at debates around MPs and arguments around local candidacies, governorship elections, etc., real debates about what it means to be a good leader and whether citizens want somebody to be a kind of civic leader who's providing public goods, or do they want them to be a more patrimonial leader who's providing those targeted resources? And so what the book is, you know, the book is sort of an appeal for people to actually understand the elections in a much more sophisticated way. In other words, don't just look at how do people vote and who wins. Actually look at how elections transform how people think about themselves and how they think about their relationship to the state. And in that, we were kind of inspired by Stefan Nimberg. Um, and Stefan was part of the project at the very beginning. And then obviously Videm took off and he, he went on to, to focus on that. But in his book, of course, on democracy and elections in Africa, he you know, runs the argument that if you repeatedly hold elections, you over, you know, and three elections in a row is, seems to be a particularly significant threshold, that elections drive democratization, that repeatedly holding elections will improve the quality of democracy over time. And one of his hypotheses in there is that, you know, one of the reasons that might happen is that holding elections kind of trains voters in democratic arts, it instills democratic norms and values and so on. So what we wanted to do in the book was kind of test that. Is it true that if people take, you know, is it true that if people go through multiple elections, they will start to become more democratic in their attitudes and that will then support, you know, a process of democratization? And of course, the answer, as you won't be surprised to know, is that it's a bit more complicated than that, right? Uh, because people are experiencing two things at the same time. They're experiencing a system which is telling them that they're in a meritocratic state that's delivering, but they're also experiencing a reality which is much more complicated. They're experiencing a reality in which there is, you know, elements of patrimonialism and contestation and corruption and, you know, poor electoral performance by the electoral management body. And so what we describe in the book is these kind of two processes happening at the same time. You know, people are, in a sense, being indoctrinated into a kind of form of multi-party politics. But with lots of contradictory elements going on at the same time. So people aren't simply becoming, you know, more democratic in their attitudes just by going through multiple elections. Neither are they experiencing every election and getting frustrated and, you know, being more willing to tolerate authoritarianism. Actually, both of these things are kind of happening at the same time. And so people's attitudes towards elections and attitudes towards democracy, you know, are very complex. And what we actually describe is a kind of landscape in which most people we talk to actually recognize the value both of a kind of civic meritocratic state and of leaders who actually act in some points in sort of patrimonial ways. And they recognize both of those things. And they want states that to some extent deliver both of those things. Um, And that means that we actually get a form of politics, which from the outside might look like the stereotype of Africa. It's all, you know, it's all ethnicity, it's all big men, but actually is much more complicated. And I'll just give you two examples of the way it's more complicated and then then stop going on. But I'm excited about this book. But, But one thing I think, you know, that's really interesting is that you can't just buy votes. Right. And anybody who actually knows anything about African elections knows you can't just buy votes. If you turn up 
to a village in Malawi or a village in Kenya and the people there don't know you and you have not been somebody that has gone to them and built a relationship with them and if they don't see you as a credible member of the community who will respect their interests and who can be trusted simply turning up and handing over five hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is is not going to win you the election and there's loads of stories in the book of candidates who tried to buy their way to power and were rejected by the electorate in favor of candidates of a lot less money because they weren't seen to be authentic. They weren't seen to be legitimate. They didn't conform to local norms of expectations of what a leader should be. And what we actually find is that in most countries, and we look at Kenya and Ghana and Uganda, actually what we find is that people think that vote buying and giving money is something that is okay if it's legitimated by a much broader relationship of care. In other words, if there's a sustained relationship between a leader and a community that is evolved over multiple years and involves multiple forms of assistance, providing money within that is legitimated as something that's legitimate and okay around elections which should not be punished. But if somebody turns up to the community and simply tries to buy votes outside of that relationship, people have a very different attitude. They define that as vote buying and they see that as corrupt and problematic. So you can't just buy votes. You actually have to understand local understandings of what it is to be a legitimate leader and you have to conform to those as well as bringing your money. Just to give one, you know, one other example, it's also true then that you know, if you think about the way in which leaders position themselves, there's again a tendency to often say, ah, well, all leaders are you know, trying to mobilize ethnic folks using money. But actually, that's not how most leaders in Africa present themselves. Most presidential candidates know they need to at least look during the election campaign presidential. They need to look like they're not just going to rule in favor of one community. There's lots of reasons for that. One is that there aren't that many countries where one ethnic group represents a majority of the population. So they need a coalition of other ethnic groups. But it's also because even members of their own ethnic group don't want to elect necessarily something that you would call a tribalist. In most countries, the term tribalist is actually a term of abuse, not a term of endearment. And so what we actually show is lots of leaders who go to quite great lengths to try and portray themselves as being more national and not simply representing one particular community. And again, to go back to Kenya right now, William Ruto is a great example of that. He's arguing that he's for all Kenyans who are hustlers. Uh, He's arguing that he's going to run a national campaign with a national party, and he's arguing that it's not going to be ethnic. And he's critiquing implicitly that past model of big men politics, where each coalition member simply delivers the support of their community as a bloc. So again, actually, whether we look at voters or we look at political leaders, is a much more complex moral economy of what it is to be legitimate and to be acceptable. It's not just about ethnicity. Those ideas are actually mixed and combined in complicated ways with what it is to be civic and what it is to be meritocratic. And those ideas hold. And so just to end, sorry, this is long now to read, but to, the key point I think that we take out of that, which I think is really important, is we say, you know, actually these ideas of democracy and meritocracy are not simply something that's been taken from outside Africa and implanted and some alien Western kind of model. Actually, they have been domesticated, they are engaged, they are processes which, you know, and, and, and the ideas and attitudes around these now have evolved over many, many years, including, of course, from pre-colonial African societies, which often included ideas of checks and balances and limits on the power of political leaders. And these are things that are actually deeply believed in by citizens. They're not simply something that people pay lip service to. And so we see both of these kind of ideals of leadership, you know, the more patrimonial and the more civic, as things that are genuinely rooted um, in African societies. Again, I should say that the book only focuses on three countries and we're very cautious to say that you can't necessarily generalize, of course, to other countries in Africa and other political systems. But I do think that it's really important that we start to take this slightly more, shall we say, cautious uh, approach to elections and, and a much more complicated approach to understanding things like ethnic politics and vote buying and so on. Let's talk a bit about leadership, because I I do see your point that there is far more 
interest, maybe there's even a tendency for leaders to project themselves, you know, as being presidential, representing the whole country. And yet there is, as you know, in a country like Malawi, there is always this tendency, this expectation from your own group that it is their turn now to be prioritized because the previous regime prioritized their group. So there are all of these pressures and surely it isn't easy for for a president to you know, represent the whole country and yet not somehow prioritize his or her own ethnic group. So that's one issue. Then the other one has to do with you know, some candidates, some leaders trying to perhaps not want to look very presidential. And I'm thinking about the late John Magufuli in Tanzania. You know, when he came to power, he, he, a lot of people thought he was a breath of fresh air. He was going on, on you know, these surprise inspections at hospitals to figure out whether equipment was working and then punishing people. He was cleaning the streets. He was basically rolling up his sleeves and doing, you know, all the unpresidential kind of things. But that initial euphoria ended up being very short-lived and there were authoritarian tendencies also. How would you characterize some of these leaders, these charismatic individuals, not just the Kagamas, but also the Magufulis who claim to be reformers, they're going to shake things up. And then, unfortunately, many of these leaders disappoint, which I think also helps explain why people are a bit frustrated with democracy. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right about, you know, that first point about how difficult it is to to bring together these different expectations. And I often say to people after someone's won, you know, Hichilima, Zambia, Chiquera, Malawi, you know, be careful how much you expect from this person, because this person will have intense pressure on them from their own community to deliver first and foremost to their community. But they've also made these promises to the nation you know, that they're going to deliver public goods and, and deliver development for everybody. And those two things are very hard to do at the same time. Um, and that's not to excuse the, you know, the disappointments that people have in leaders who fail to perform in government. But I think we do need to develop a better understanding of why that happens and the competing pressures that are placed on people uh, after they win office. And that helps to explain why you know, leaders often fail to deliver in the ways that we would hope. In terms of what you were talking about with Magafuli, you know, I think this is really interesting. And of course, we have seen, you know, the rise of a kind of populist politics in, in recent years. Michael Sata, of course, winning in Zambia in 2011. Uh, Malema, we could talk about perhaps in South Africa, Magafuli in Tanzania. I think there are two things, you know, maybe to say here. One is, you know, actually, in some ways, it's interesting to me that we don't see more populists. Um, I've you know, had conversations with, with people like Nick Van der Waal about this. And, and actually, if you look at Africa, you know, if you look at the number of kind of high density, low income areas, you know, what people would call slums, etc. If you look at, you know, how packed people are into those areas, how disappointed people are, um, you know, in some ways, it's surprising that we don't see more leaders trying to mobilize a kind of classic populist trope. Um, we've actually seen relatively few uh, that have done it successfully. And Michael Sata is perhaps... Uh, the only one who's really won power on a classic populist uh, trope. I mean, my great former PhD student, Dan Paget kind of argues that Magafuli has elements of populism, but also elements of, of other things. It isn't a classic populist. Um, so I think the first thing to say is it's quite interesting that we haven't seen more populists in a way. Um, and of course, if, you know, the significance of ethnicity and the salience of ethnicity perhaps mitigates against, you know, a kind of cross-ethnic classical kind of populist model. But nonetheless, you might have thought we'd see see more of that. And perhaps we will in the next 10 years with the process of urbanization that's currently going on. The second thing to say is you asked about, you know, why, why do these particular leaders disappoint? And I think one of the reasons they disappoint is that one of the things populists tend to do is they tend to undermine institutions. So almost every population you know, that I've studied has basically argued that, you know, they can in some way channel the common man. They understand what the common man wants. And they understand what the common man needs. And they are a man of action who is going to deliver that. And because of that, because they are connected to the common man, and so they believe they have that legitimacy, and because uh, they're a man of action and they're effective and efficient, they're not going to put up with institutional checks and balances. And so what they often do are things that are actually quite good 
good in the sense that you want the anti-corruption campaign, you want the cleaning up of the health system, etc. But the way in which it's done doesn't actually follow the constitution, doesn't follow the rule of law, doesn't follow the committee system. The way that money is spent doesn't actually follow the procurement system, etc., etc. So what you end up with is a system that initially looks like it's working very well, but it's actually working in a way that it undermines all of the institutional mechanisms and checks and balances of the system. And the problem then is that if you run that system for a couple of years and then either the populist leader themselves goes bad or loses direction or starts to become more corrupt or, you know, as with Michael Sata, you see the leader dying in office and somebody else then inherits the system. What you've created is a system that is completely open to abuse because all of the checks and balances and protocols that used to be there have been removed in the name of serving the people. And so I think, you know, for me, I kind of see populist leaders as a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you know, Michael Sata came into power in Zambia and he delivered some things. He delivered, you know, a minimum wage. He delivered greater expenditure on public services. And you could see that as being, you know, a populist leader delivering for the common man. But at the same time, you have this process of institutional decay uh, and de-democratization, which then makes the country more open to both corruption and to authoritarian backsliding. And I think that's, to me, a kind of, you know, I think Magafuli fits in that model as well. And if we see populists win in other countries, I would suspect that we might also see that kind of arc of people being very excited in the first year and then increasingly worried as we move on from that. One final set of issues, Nick, I'd like to talk to you about has to do with another wonderful book that you've written with uh, Brian Klaas, How to Rig an Election. Most of us would think that the surest way is to stuff the ballot boxes, but you, of course, in the book highlight many other very creative and perhaps not so creative ways of rigging elections. You could prevent opposition supporters from getting an ID card, prevent them from coming to the election booths, organize election centers very far away from where people who will most likely not vote for you uh, live, you know, uh, you could have invisible forms of rigging. You were saying earlier about it's very difficult to actually come up and bribe, but there are ways of bribing, I suppose, the electorate. You could have various types of patronage politics and clientelism that still exist. You have political violence. Um, doing what the British did very well in India, divide and rule. And then, of course, you have media, digital tools, all of these. So all of this is, of course, happening, Nick. It happens quite regularly, which undermines people's faith in, in elections. So what would you say to people who are interested in elections, who are interested in doing something about elections being rigged, what can be done to stop these elections from being rigged in all of these ways that you highlight in the book? Well, it's, it's tough, right? It's tough because often the people in power have the most money and the most capacity, and they're always one step ahead. I mean, I remember uh, someone from a domestic observation group once saying to me, you know, the problem is we're always trying to fix the last election and the government always, always preparing to rig the next one. And what he meant was <laughs> the government always has a new strategy. So we're fixing the voters register. The government's finding a new way of manipulating the vote. Um, and that there's a risk that we kind of spend our entire time chasing our tails with governments evolving. I think that there's a bunch of things I would say. I mean, one, you know, in general, I think we need to spend more money. I think given how important elections are, you know, people always say, ah, you focus too much on elections. And there's an element of truth in that, in the sense that, you know, we should never say that elections equate to democracy. Democracy is so much more than elections. And if we don't have the other aspects of democracy, elections actually aren't very meaningful. But while that's true, it's also true that actually of all the things that we spend money on, we don't spend that much on, on supporting and trying to promote as an international community, as domestic NGOs, as civil society groups, um, better quality elections. And if we're going to keep up with authoritarians who want to manipulate them, there's going to be need to, there's going to need to be more expenditure and more focused expenditure. So that's the first thing. The second thing is... You know, from all of my experience, and I don't know how many elections I've watched, how many countries, but but we might maybe 10, 20 elections now. The one thing that is most effective at stopping election rigging is an opposition party that is really well organized and is able to put its own party agents in every polling station in the country. 
that was what was really important when I was in Ghana in 2016 uh, and allowed the opposition party, the MPP at the time, to basically create a parallel vote and tell everybody basically that they'd won the election before the Electoral Commission had announced that they'd won the election. And that was also very important in Zambia where UPND basically did a good job of getting party agents into polling stations. And actually, people forget this now, but on the floor of the Electoral Commission, when the first set of results were being read out, actually challenged the commission and forced them to go back and re-look at a result that the commission was going to release that was different to the result that the party agents had identified and recorded on the ground. So those party agents in every polling station can create that parallel set of results. And where that happens, it becomes significantly more difficult for the ruling party to rig because what you end up with is a model where actually once the results have been released any kind of fixing of the results in terms of the tallying process can be exposed by the party agents. Now, it's very difficult to do that. It costs a lot of money to get party agents into all those polling stations. It's a big infrastructural job. I mean, imagine a country like Kenya with 45,000 polling stations. You want two people in each of those polling stations. That's 90,000 people you're training. It's also difficult because, of course, if there's violence and if your opposition, if your ruling party has strongholds, it might be almost impossible physically, say, to get your party agents in. But I think that's something that opposition parties really need to pay attention to because it's the one thing that actually, as it were, puts the fate of the elections in their own hands. Now, of course, what that doesn't deal with is all the invisible strategies that happen well ahead of the election, as you were talking about, you know, a, a manipulated electoral register, uh, you know, not allowing opposition supporters to get ID cards so they can't even get documentation to get on the register in the first place, all those other strategies. And there, I think one of the things that we you know, could all do is to be much clearer about what is and is not a free and fair election and to be much stronger in the standards that we apply. Because I think there's a tendency to say, if there's rigging on the day, if there's fraud on the day, that's an unfree and unfair election. If there's violence on the day or just before, that's an unfree and unfair election. But if the systematic gerrymandering so that actually the ruling party are electing way more MPs than they should be from a small number of votes, if the systematic disenfranchisement of certain communities, if the systematic censorship of the media so that the opposition can't get their message out, that's also unfree and unfair. And I think we need to start being firmer and clearer at an earlier stage in election campaigns that those practices are are also unacceptable and therefore kind of increasing the stakes of that kind of manipulation which at the minute you know leaders can get away with with very low cost but you know all of that said and of course there are some other examples you know we could talk a bit more about the use of digital technology if you're interested but it is you know it's a constant struggle uh, and I think one of the key things you know that I talked about after the Zambian elections is that sometimes for opposition parties to win they have to win big because they have to win big enough to create a margin so that even if the ruling party rigs by three or four percent, they're still the winners. And so whenever I talk to opposition party supporters, I say, if you really want to win, you need to win by five percent or more. I think that's a great point. And Zambia is a very good case, the recent Zambian election here. The point you make, you know, about this tendency we have in the international community among election observers, and there's been so much criticism of international election observers that there's often this tendency of focusing on that event, that election day, and to somehow ignore and not have the capacity or the knowledge to follow what actually happened, the process that led up to this event. And so what would you say about the state of election observers? What is it that they need to do differently now? Because there's been mounting criticism of international election observers, and Malawi is a great case where a lot of people have lost faith in these election observers. What should election observers do differently? Well, first of all, I want to, I want to defend observers a little bit because um, you know I, I work quite closely with international election observers and we have a new program called Electa where we're trying to bring observers, international domestic observers, civil society groups, academics together to have exactly the conversation you know that you just prompted so thank you and, and we're hoping to bring people together in a genuine partnership and I think observers do some fantastic work and they, and they have really changed in response to you know feedback and criticism over the years. We now see for example long-term observers as a core part of the process. We now see 
party, um, you know, real focus on explaining the context and so on. And, and we see a growing recognition of some of the issues that, that you were raising yourself. I think what, what I would like to see, you know, now having made those developments is, is a couple of other things. One, I think you'll now see if you read a lot of election observation reports, all of those longer term issues are actually there. They'll be discussed often very well, you know, with, with a lot of sophistication and context and understanding, but they won't be used as evidence that the election wasn't good enough quality. Uh, we have, for example, seen a growing focus on long term election observation, on you know teaming up with domestic organizations, on learning from domestic uh, experts and so on in terms of being able to provide that long term and, and uh, political context. What I think we really need to see now from international observers is to respond to the challenges and the crises of the last two years. And I think there's two or three ways in which they can do that. So one those long-term contextual factors are much more likely to be included in observation reports now, but not to be used as evidence that there has been manipulation and that the election wasn't good enough. And I think we need to see those issues actually amplified in terms of the weight that they have in terms of the overall evaluation that election observers come to. I think observers, you know, perhaps quite rightly moved away from making categorical decisions about is this election okay or not, because they didn't want to be the only arbiters of that and because in most cases you know these are sliding scales it's not that an election is perfect or it's awful it's almost always somewhere in between but I think they can still within that find a much stronger language about whether an election was good enough whether it needs to be improved and perhaps we need to find a different language in a way of talking about elections not just are they free and fair or not but you know, was this a better election than the last one? What's the extent of improvement that's necessary on the basis of this election? I think observers need to be franker and clearer in terms of what their reports actually mean. And I also think we need to support observers to react. One of the things that we've seen in the last few years is, you know, elections across Africa and other parts of the world have become increasingly digital. We have digital uh, voter registration, sometimes digital voter verification, in a very small number of cases, even digital voting. And yet we have not supported our international election observers in Africa to have the budgets to be able to actually cover all of those developments and the developments with social media and the fact that many of those issues that are being shared on social media are being shared in multiple languages. We haven't resourced international election groups to the extent that they can actually uh, cover all of those new developments with experts and therefore be able to monitor, as it were, the new election frontier. And I think if we want them to do a great job, we also therefore need to be able to resource them to be able to step up to the plate and to be able to monitor those new digital processes. And, you know, we often imagine digital technology as being the solution you know, to the challenges of democracy in elections. But actually, often they're also the problem. And we've seen in a number of countries in Africa, including, you know, Kenya, where I am now, in the 2017 elections, for example, the digital process itself became the controversy. Was the digital process hacked? How was it manipulated? Could there be access to the servers of the Electoral Commission? Was that given to members of the ruling party? The digital process itself became the controversy. So if we want to empower and strengthen our observers, um, then we need to create a situation in which they can monitor those processes effectively. But of course, none of this is going to matter if we don't also empower our observation groups to be more frank and to speak more clearly. And I've met many members of observation groups over the years who've wanted to say something a bit more more strong uh, and a bit more powerful, um, but been constrained, been constrained by uh, the politics that go on behind the scenes, been constrained by uh, the organisations that they work for. And I think one of the things that international election observation needs to really grapple with is creating groups that are more genuinely independent and more able to actually speak their minds, because I don't think in most cases the situation is that the observers on the ground don't know what's going on. In most cases I've been involved in, they do, but there's other reasons why they don't come out and, uh, and declare uh, the election as being deeply problematic. And the final thing I'll say there, in just terms of you know, trying to understand where observers are coming from, is it's not an easy decision. Right? If you're in a country that you think 
uh, perhaps declaring the election to be problematic will inspire protests. You think perhaps those protests could turn violent. It could even be the case that an international statement, the election wasn't good enough, sparks conflict and leads to loss of life. You know, that's a really complicated, difficult decision uh, that has major consequences that are really significant that most of us don't have to deal with and grapple with in our everyday lives. So to cut a long story short, I do think you know, there are multiple ways in which international observation can and should uh, improve and get stronger. But I also think that if we're going to help them to do that, we need to understand that they're operating within a difficult environment and they have very difficult decisions to make. It was wonderful to chat with you today, Nick. Thanks so much for coming on my show. Absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.